All right, so last week in this video above, if you are needing to go back and watch that, I highly suggest you do that before you keep keep going. <laughs> um, so we talked about, you know, setting goals and and the why behind why you have rabbits. Um, and so what do you want out of it? So I'm not going to I'm not going to dive in. <laughs> I'm not going to dive into that um, because you need to go back and watch that one. But so you see so you you've set those goals. Well, well now what? Now, maybe you have a herd that is kind of already a hot mess a little bit. We're going to cover that and how to clean that up. But what are you going to do with those goals? You need to use that that mindset, that that want, that desire to be your guide in your choices. One, to keep you focused because so many people will see, oh, you raise rabbits. Well... Uh, my kid doesn't want to play with it anymore. Um, you know, you someone just may have decided they're sick of them and they're going to ask you to take on the rabbit that may not even be the breed that you have. So here's, here's what I'm going to get into before I show you how to pare down a herd that you already have established and how to tweak it to stay focused towards your goals, okay? you got to set boundaries, okay? Now... Maybe, maybe it is the same breed, but I never want you to feel like you have to cover up or fix someone else's mistakes. You don't owe them anything and you owe it to the rabbits that you have to not take on so many that you are feeling strained or that you, it, it's becoming difficult to cover the cost. Okay. You owe it to the animals you have to keep your finances in check and to where you can house them and care for them at the level that you currently do. You add more to that and your time's going to get strained. Your your finances are gonna get strained. Maybe you don't even have housing for them. So you're either one gonna have to go buy one, which again is a money draw, or maybe you're gonna have to go pick up whatever it is. And again, that's a time and money suck. Um, you know, and nothing is free. Maybe you've got people asking you those things. You have to be willing to say no. So here's an example of what um, I've, I've some words <laughs> that I've learned to put together when someone has asked me. And so one, I raise French slops and if it's not a French slop, I'm not taking it. And two, I have offered to help them find a home for it. And so that's the key. Maybe you don't take it, but maybe you have the connections to be able to do that. And so we're not going to be, you know, a homing, um, what's the middleman? Yeah, <laughs> we're not going to be a middleman for a bunch of people because if you start seeing that happen too much, you're going to be like, mm, hold on. However, it is okay to help, but not cause your own rabbitry to strain, Okay. Set those rules, set those boundaries, so you are willing and able to say no. Now, when it comes to making the call of if it's the same breed, because I've had someone approach me where they were like, well, do you want to trade? I think it was a doe for a buck or something along those lines. But here's what happened. I noticed in the picture that the rabbits were running all over the ground, for one, which is not something that I do for, my, for multiple health reasons. But two, that tells me that their behavior is off. Like they're gonna be a jerk, most likely. Cause rabbits do not, they start going into this more wild mindset when you let them act like a wild rabbit. Do you see? I knew they would be a handful. So I decided to say no. <laughs> um, and so I just gave the reasons why. Honesty is the best policy for sure. So if it is the same breed, look at look at some of those those clues too like maybe someone doesn't raise it the way that you do and so that that gives you almost a problem child if that makes sense but never take an animal that if your rabbit quality is here and that rabbit is down here that's going to take your rabbit quality herd back always take them to where they're the same or better now maybe you offer to pay for something that's better that's totally fine but never go backwards when it comes to the quality of your animals, okay? Because you've worked hard to get to a certain point. 
and it takes time. It's not like you're gonna, it's gonna happen overnight, okay? So just think about that. Think about, you know, the, the possibilities that could be behind it that you may not quite see. Yes, it's easy to want to get someone out of their pickle, <laughs> but you don't know it to them, okay? And also use these guides to help you when you're, maybe you go to a rabbit show and you see all these other breeds and they're so cool and all of that, but when you look at it and you go, oh, that breed's neat, but you don't have a cage that's the right size for it. Or maybe, you know, it takes having multiple breeds it's going to pull away the capacity that you have to increase the quality of your current purpose-driven rabbitry. Do you see that? So just think about those things and then we're going to turn around and show, turn the screen around so you can see how an imaginary herd, this isn't anything real, but I just came up with a good general combination of stuff that I've seen <laughs> in the wild out there um, where how I would pare it down to one being a focused rabbitry and one that has goals, okay? All right, so here is an imaginary herd with the imaginary goal of having a meat supply and having a second breed that allows for or covers the cost of the meat producing animals. So now maybe you don't want meat at all and that's totally fine. Um, so you can just kind of ignore this here. But I just kind of wanted to get, I don't want to say a hodgepodge, but I see a lot of animals or <laughs> rabbit raisers with a lot of animals and different breeds. And the problem with that is you get stretched too thin and you're not able to focus well on one and getting known for that and getting to have, you know, the best animals you can possibly have and people spreading the word about that breed that you raise because, and I'm not going to go into it because that doesn't have anything to do with this topic um, at the moment, but when people know what to recommend you for as far as breeds go, you're going to get word of mouth recommendations a lot faster. So with this right here, there are five bucks. That's just not necessary. And even if you are raising them to sell, three is plenty. Um, so definitely get rid of the two of them there. Even if you can get down to two and assuming that you're only raising them for meat, then that is, is plenty as well. Four bucks is okay, except for the fact that, like I said, that's still one extra than most breeds would need. But the only caveat to that is that Dutch are one of those breeds that need to be bred to a specific color. You can't just pick whatever color you choose to breed together. Um, and uh, unlike the French lops where it doesn't really matter the color you breed to each other. But if you have a breed that like that and you have two breeds or two bucks for each color avenue, I guess you could say, then that's fine. Um, but otherwise, you know, the two to three per breed is, is ideal. Then here is where <laughs> the emotions can sometimes feel a little hard and you kind of feel guilty sometimes about maybe letting an animal go or finding it a new home. But here's the thing. You do not owe it to anyone to take their mistakes. So maybe these three older mini Laptos are not producing for whatever reason, but maybe you took on someone's, you know, someone contacted you and was like, well, I don't want to do it anymore, whatever. Whatever the reason was, you do not have to hold on to them. So maybe you could find a good home for them. Maybe they're completely on their last leg, then that's fine. Let them live out their life or if they've got maybe a year left on them, if that. But maybe they are, you know, just a couple of years old and they could make someone else a decent pet. Or um, maybe they're in decent enough shape that they could still be shown and give them to a 4-H kid or something. But find a way to get them a decent home to where they're not draining your income. Now, the last one here is the English Angoras. Now, the idea with them is that they are woolers or for spinning their wool for yarn or something along those lines. So that's kind of a hobby aspect to them. However, what if you could trade out one of the bucks for a doe and then have the ability to sell their offspring, even if it's just one litter a year, that would more than cover the expense of keeping these two. Now, here's something that is another idea or avenue. 
Angoras typically are, depending on, there's a couple different ones, but typically on each Angora, they are a meat breed. And so I know that maybe doesn't sound <laughs> ideal or um, what someone might want to hear, but what if they could be your meat breed on top of having the wool for spinning? Because the reason I want you to think about what you're raising is when you have these three, you're still, again, stretching yourself pretty thin when it comes to resources and management and being able to sell the core breeds that you have, okay? So that's where staying focused and keeping it narrow helps people to know what to come to you for, okay? So that personally is how I would pare down an imaginary herd that has imaginary goals of trying to be still have the family meat supply here, but also having enough income to cover the costs, okay? This requires you to be very careful about, you know, how much you're selling them for, not taking deals if someone is trying to sucker you, things like that. So I'm going to leave it at that before I go on to another rant, but that is how I would pare down a herd and you should start thinking about doing if you're feeling like your herd is just a little bit messy.